uh, was born and raised in Colombia. Colombia uh, in South America, um, a country about the size of maybe the state of Texas, um, but with a very rough history and reputation, but with amazing biodiversity, um, only second to Brazil, you know, in diversity of plant, animal species, and ecosystems. It's the land of Shakira, the land of <laughs> Sofia Vergara, and is the place of the best coffee in the world. So there you go. <laughs> I was born and raised in this family of 10 kids. And um, the youngest of them all, the little one on the motorcycle, that's me. And yes, eight boys and two girls. So you can imagine, I learned survival skills at a very early age, right? <laughs> Had to deal with a lot of testosterone in my family growing up. <laughs> but I guess that shaped my character and in a way, right? And uh, both my parents were school teachers. So we grew up in a home where we were encouraged to find meaning in life, you find uh, something to contribute to to humanity, and find happiness in our own way. So I started that search through architecture and landscape architecture, of all things, right? Little I know I was going to find that meaning and that happiness in the brown eyes of this one pound little monkey. <laughs> I learned about cotton top tamarinds for the first time when I got my first job as a landscape architect at the Barranquilla Zoo, my hometown. And uh, never heard of it, you know, it's a one pound monkey. Um, and every time I had to design an exhibit while I was the landscape architect of the zoo, I had to do a lot of research on the species that I was going to design this exhibit for. So when I started looking into, you know, cotton top tamarinds, which I've never heard of, um, one of the things that I struck me really hard is that they were only found in that little red dot in our big planet. It's the country of Colombia, that's it. Nowhere else in the world. And not even in the whole country, but just in that little black spot in the north region of our country. So I was like, wow, how did I not know anything about this while I was growing up in the school or anywhere? And then I learned they live in the beautiful ecosystem called, can you hit play on that please? No, well, yeah, thank you. In the beautiful ecosystem called the tropical dry forest, and it's dry forest because six months out of the year you get no rain at all. Um, and I had a lot of fun learning how similar they are to us humans because they live in family groups like we do. So mom, dad, and babies. Babies uh, learn everything from their parents just like we do. And when they grow, you know, to be a teenagers or juveniles, they either leave home or they get kicked out of the house, just like it happens with us as well, right? <laughs> they are very territorial. So they live in an area in hectares of forest, and um, they defend their territory just like we do in our homes and our families. And they have a very sophisticated communication system just like we do. And one of the things I always remember is, why are they so important? And I really enjoyed learning that they feed from a lot of fruits that grow in the forest, in the trees, they swallow those seeds, and when they poop, a few times a day, actually, like five, <laughs> they plant those seeds, and those seeds come ready to germinate. So they take from the forest, but they give back to the forest, and they keep the forest healthy and growing. So I thought that was really, that was really cool, and I enjoyed learning. But something that hit me really hard was the fact that they were critically endangered, that I learned that while I was doing my research as well. And it's mostly because of habitat loss generated by giving way to cattle ranching, agriculture, and more recently, mining and urban development. So their forest uh, is down to less than 8% of what there used to be in you know, four or five decades um, ago. And it's not only the forestation, but something we call fragmentation, which is when you open up a tract of forest, and you isolate forest areas, then for a, tree, uh, a, a species that always hangs up, up in the trees, 30 to 40 feet above the ground, never comes down to the ground because it gets eaten by a boa snake or a raptor bird or a small mammal, which are their natural predators, um, this is a huge problem. 
And it can also affect their genetic viability in the long term because it's like staying in an island for too long and then you don't get to find resources or to maintain your species. And on top of all of that, <laughs> we got cotton tusks were hunted for the pet trade. And I guess it's people that, like me, had no idea that this is a wild animal, very unique and very critically endangered. So this was very troubling and I, it just really, I was compelled to do something about it. And for those weird turns in life, I ended up being the director of the zoo. So I said, okay, this is my chance to uh, do something about it. And that's when I met Dr. Ann Savage, who is a, a American biologist that had been studying cotton tops for about 10 years in Colombia, had no idea about that. Uh, we partners started collaborating, cotton tops became the symbol of the Barranquilla Zoo. And, um, and then I ended up leaving the zoo and coming full time to work with Proyecto Titi, and this was 20 years ago. So uh, that's my short history. In those 20 years, you know, we've been able to put together a very effective model that combines field research, you know, we've learned a lot about the species, we've published a lot of information about their biology, their ecology, the forest protection being deforestation and fragmentation, the main threat, um, but also with a very strong social component because we have to get rid of people having cotton tops as pets. So our education and awareness programs are really focused on understanding that that, that cannot continue to happen. And, and of course our social programs, and I know many of you were enjoying the eco mochilas and the little plush toys made by the communities as opportunities to generate an income and then reduce the need to use forest resources for subsistence. And we really you know, believe after accomplishing, you know, putting together this model, something great has been also our opportunity to put cotton tops in the political agenda, in the agenda of the environmental authorities, and also media, national and international media. And just wanted to call your attention to a piece that made by CNN that just was just released a month ago. You can find it in our social media and our Instagrams, a great piece about our efforts. So calling attention, it, it just gives us the opportunity to, to do more. But we understand that there's two things we need to continue doing, even though we've accomplished a lot. And it is, we need to bring back the forest. There's not enough forest for the cotton tops. And we need to stop people having cotton tops as pets. And in that line of thought, you know, we have worked a lot over the last 10 years to protect forests. We've worked with the environmental authorities, to created four protect, public protected areas. We've created our own protected area, thanks to many of you here that have contributed to us. And it's now um, a thousand acres uh, by a national park. And we work with the local farmers as well to create forest corridors that connect those isolated protected areas through green corridors. So as we accomplish that, you know, you, you tend to think that, uh, okay, it's a matter of bringing back the forest is a matter of planting trees. Can you hit play on that, please? But it's a little more than that. <laughs> so the process, I just want you to look at this two minute video on, um, our forest restoration work, and it starts by collecting the seeds uh, that grow in the forest. And for this, it's been very important, all the research we've done about what species cotton tops consume. So we go there, when these trees are blooming, we collect the seeds, right? And uh, these are usually seeds from trees, again, that provide food or shelter to cotton top, because we want uh, this forest to be functional for cotton tops. And there's actually about 70 different species that we are, we are working with. So we plant them in our um, nursery. And we have learned a lot about each of these species has a different germinating requirement. So it's very demanding. Some of them you need to put them in water. Some of them you need to put them in the sun. Some of them you can just plant them right away. And then while we patiently wait until the seedlings grow and the plant germinate, we get some enriched soil and put it on little nursery bags. When they start coming out, we put them in the nursery bags and then it starts the whole pampering process for a few months, six to eight months. These trees, we give them a lot of love, we prune them, water them and weed them. Um, and then we wait until they reach a planting size, usually about a foot and a half or two feet when they can be planted in the forest restoration areas. And um, <laughs> before we plant, these uh, saplings, we mark them all with flagging tape so that we can recognize them and monitor their growth. 
and some of them we put a tag with a code so that then we you know measure how tall they are when we plant them and then we go back next year and track their growth their survival and uh, their 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 sanitary stage and then when the rainy season comes we need to start planting these trees and so we basically put together an army of people, like including farmers, neighbors, and families of our staff and our farmers. And with their burros, we take these saplings to the areas that we work on, which are not accessible by anything else but food or burro, <laughs> not a motorcycle even. We dig the holes, put some hydro retainer for when the dry season comes, and um, they can uh, have some water reserved there for them. We give them our blessing, and then we wait for them to grow. And you may think that's the end of it. That's actually the beginning of it. Because <laughs> from then on, it's all about monitoring their growth, monitoring their survival, and um, just following through to make sure that these trees are growing and that our restoration efforts are effective. So it is quite a demanding process. Um, oops. And we do this for cotton top tamarins at Proyecto DT, but when we're protecting the forest for the monkeys, we're protecting the forest for all these amazing species that are part of the same tropical dry forest ecosystem, a wide variety of plants and animals. And not only for the animals, we do this for ourselves, for the people. And then we want to connect people to understand that thanks to the forest, we have water, we have shelter, we have food, and we have resources if we use them sustainably. And that is the reason why our all of this forest restoration program is has a very strong social component because everything is done by people we hire locally from the local communities. So what best way to engage the local community than providing stable jobs that pay well and that provide them all sorts of benefits and an opportunity to train, to understand and to engage. And, you know, we right now have 15 staff that work in our nursery, but when we plant those trees, we have to hire at least 20 more people and, and basically create groups of, 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 of people planting these trees for three, four months. So that's another opportunity to provide stable jobs and we have to hire a lot of local services. So it's a small sort of microeconomy that happens when we're planting all these trees. And um, of course, this is not for free for them because they have to commit to reduce the use in forest resources and not having cotton tops as pets. Don't even look at the cotton tops, just leave them alone in the forest. Um, and of course, you know, when you see a benefit, when you see a tangible benefit, an income, a job, a stability, then you commit to that. So it is very important that all this restoration program has a very strong social component, not only for the people that work with us or that we hire for the planting, but also for their families. So one of the things we have been um, putting a lot of attention in, 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 in uh, it actually uh, is an idea that came with COVID because we couldn't go to the schools to give our classes. So we came up with this puppet show that tells a story about how tough it is for a cotton top to be taken out of their family, to be taken out of their home and taken into a very strange environment where they don't have trees, where they don't have their food, their fruits, and we don't have their family. And it has become very effective. And this gave us an opportunity to go beyond schools. And we started taking this puppet show to many different communities that live close to the forest, but that we never, nobody has access to that. Nobody goes there. And we have also evaluated how effective this is and how easy kids understand because it touches their heart. And it's, it, we talk about family and we talk about um, how, how painful it is. And it's becoming very effective. So one ambitious goal we have is to create the Titi Van and, and, and have a mobile unit that can go to many remote places, especially those where we are not working at the moment and that still have uh, uh, statistics on traffic of cotton top tamarins. Um, and, and our hope is that these kids commit to not having cotton tops as pets. As they grow old, they stay true to their commitment while it gives us time to grow more forests. Because our second ambitious goal is to continue bringing back the forest. This is what we need to do in order to save these species and to provide all these benefits. So we are working right now in a fundraising campaign to purchase the uh, property on the red outline, which is neighbor to our forest reserve on dark green. 
which in turn is neighbor to the national park on light green in this region. And this is a, a cattle ranch, complete cattle ranch that is uh, for sale by their owners because they're aging and they don't want to have it anymore. And it's a great opportunity for us to basically double up the size of our forest reserve and start planting so many trees. So we can double up the number of people that we hire and double up the benefits that we're generating for the local communities. And when you zoom out and see the, the overall context of this region, you can see the white outline on the, uh, the farm that we want to purchase and restore and how important it is for the whole connectivity of the region between protected areas and all the corridors that are being created with, uh, in partnership with the farmers and thanks to many of you who have uh, supported our forest restoration efforts. Um, can you hit play, please? And so you'll see a short video of the Santa Elena property, all the cows or the bare soil, all the fragmentation that is very typical of you know, our region. And what we wanna do is being able to acquire this land and turn it into the beautiful forest you're about to see in the video, which is our reserve. So what a difference of landscape, right? And it's, it's just crushing. And, and these are forests that are still recovering. They're five, five to six year forests. And so this is what we wanna do and this is what we need to do. And we need your help to ha make this happen. Um, this is a, a panoramic view of the, the land in relation to our reserve and to the national park. And we have been very lucky to partner with ReWorld, uh, an organization led by actually a WCN donor. And um, they have created this amazing page called ReWorld.echo. And you can go in and donate an acre, or donate 10 acres, or donate 20 acres. And you will find the link in, uh, also in our bio in the Instagram uh, account of Proyecto TT. And we right now are like halfway there with a couple of grants in the pipeline, but we have a gap of $300,000 that we need to fill before the end of the year so we can acquire this land and make this happen. And again, our hope is to continue this in the long term as we grow the connectivity, as, as we grow the forest areas and connect forests so that cotton top tamarinds can have a safe life in the future and wildlife and the local communities as well. And I firmly believe that if we continue to bring back the forest and stop people from having cotton tops as pets, cotton tops will have a future beyond my lifetime and hopefully beyond my daughter's lifetime. Uh, and then maybe I can honor my parents' uh, advice to find happiness and a meaning in life and contribute to humanity by saving the species from extinction Thanks to all of you, and thanks to these amazing Colombians, some of them goofy Colombians there making faces, <laughs> which is our team, our amazing team in Colombia, sunrise to sundown, doing all the amazing work uh, that I'm sharing with you today to save a species and to contribute to humanity and that by the conservation of our country in Colombia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. Right. Um, Thank you, Zoe. Are you glad that you stayed? Because I am. <laughs> exactly. That's what I thought. <laughs> so that was amazing. And we have time for two questions. One from that slid in in Slido, and then one from you guys. So the first one is, have you seen a measurable impact of like cotton tamarinds coming back into the areas that you've reforested? Yes, we have. Um, it takes about probably, um, you know, you can cut an acre of forest in a day and it takes about 20 years, like Sam was saying before, it is a long-term thing, right? But um, these trees grow very fast, some of them, because we have, you know, 100% humidity and 90 degrees every day of, <laughs> of weather, right? It's very, not very friendly, but things grow really fast. So we have seen cotton tops coming and foraging in this new forest after the third year, because some of these trees grow, they, they shoot up when you plant them and they're like 10 feet 
in, in the, into the third year and start producing fruits. And some of the fruits that cotton tops feed from. So when they come in, they come in, they can move around, they can forage, but they have to go back to the mature forest because they sleep at night on the very large trees that provide shelter for them. So yes, they use it, uh, but still you have to wait for them to be a territory for uh, uh, an animal. They do use the corridors quite a bit, even though they're young, because they use them to just go from one place to another. So, and, and what the one thing I, it's also good to, to mention about that is that um, prior to our beginning of our restoration uh, program, there is no scientific information on how fast these trees grow, how, what the survival rate is, which do better in which soil and which you know, topographic condition or anything. So we have had to build this from scratch and we're documenting everything as we, as we go just to make sure to have this model that it, we know it's effective and then we can just replicate and hopefully it'll be less intensive in terms of human and financial resources to bring back the forest. Or just leave it alone, but we know that, you know, we know what happens because we understand and we are able to put everything together so that it is successful. So all this is happening as we learn how to rebuild and bring back a forest. Perfect, we have one last question from the floor. Thank you for your presentation. That was really wonderful to listen to. My question is, um, as you're doing these studies on the restored forest, are you noticing any significant differences in the ecological function of the restored forest versus the original forest? Yes, we are documenting as we go. And we are uh, doing wildlife surveys every five years. We, we did the first one. We're going to continue measuring. But we're putting camera traps. Um, and every twice a year in same points to measure you know, what we see. Um, and our team of field assistants, they have patrolling routes and they document everything they see. So we've been doing this for the last three years. So our hope is that over time, we can see a difference, not only in um, wildlife and the presence of wildlife in the reserve, but also the reducing of the threats as we involve more people. Because the threats may be I mean, we haven't gotten reports of people hunting cotton tops, but there are other things they hunt in this forest. They hunt arm armadillos, deer, and uh, um, uh, the hyenas, uh, the, little, the little capybara kind of, kind of animals. So, um, and, then, and then cows and cattle ranching, neighbor ranches. So, you know, our hope is to see a reduction of that over time and also an increase of the use of wildlife through all of these methods and transects and um, and camera traps and wildlife sightings and, and, and seeing cotton tops, you know, one, this particular area that we started restoring in 2021, um, cotton tops were only seen in the corridor that went through the property. And since it's all growing now, they have a territory now and they were tracking one of them. We put transmitters and track them to understand how far they go and how much they move. So yes, we're, we're taking notes of everything and being able to make conclusions and generate knowledge that can help us be more effective as we go um, and into the future and as we grow our efforts into other areas in Colombia to reduce the hunting and give more habitat to the animals. Perfect, thank you so much, Rosamia. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing.